Cinema Jaws brought to you by Know Your Company. Got 25 to 75 people in your company? Then check out knowyourcompany.com, software that helps companies like Airbnb know their company better. And we thank them for their support. And by the Midwest Game Nerds Podcast. Ever wish you had a Cinema Jaw like podcast that was about video games? Look no further than the Midwest Game Nerds podcast. Each episode talks about the latest and greatest in video games across all platforms. Whether it's VR, Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, PC, mobile, you get the idea. The Midwest Game Nerds podcast discusses it all. Tune in live on every other Sunday at 7.30 p.m. on Twitch TV backslash Midwest Game Nerds or find their episodes on YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, or at MidwestGameNerds.com And we thank them for their support. You're listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever. Recorded in Wicker Park, Chicago. My name is Matt Kay, and with me is... Rye the Movie Guy. And sitting alongside us, as always, Matt, is our engineer and local filmmaker, Elias Rodriguez. How's it going, Jawheads? This week on Cinema Jaw, we look at love stories, but not just plain old love stories, Matt. We go quirky love stories. Quirky. Quirky. I like it. You like it? I do. You were thinking awkward. But you like quirky. Quirky, awkward. I think they're synonymous. They are. These are love stories that are not normal by any means. Usually Mm -hmm. it's a character that has some type of social dysfunction or quirkiness about them. Yeah. Offbeat. Not bad. Yeah. That's another term. Yes. We are doing our top three favorite quirky love stories and we're doing this because we have a couple of great guests who are going to be joining us we do yes jim perella and robert vornkal who are the actor and writer in a new film called completely normal respectively and we watched completely normal we did it's it's exciting getting these uh indie filmmakers on this is a really a good movie i really enjoyed we'll talk about it more yep and it's a movie that the jawheads listening to this can actually rent So we'll talk to them about that as well. Yeah, it's available now. Yes. Uh, In addition to that, we have a whole lot more going on, don't we, Elias? Oh, yeah. We are going eye for an eye on Aftermath. And we have a review of The Zookeeper's Wife. Nice. Yes. And as Elias mentioned, we're going eye for an eye on Aftermath. It stars a little actor you may have heard of named Arnold Schwarzenegger. Never heard of him. Never? No. Who is he? Arnold. Arnie. All right. Okay, what? has he been in some films? A lot of films, so oh. that is why we are playing Arnold Schwarzenegger movie trivia. See, if he was like a governor of a state, maybe then I would remember maybe him. Maybe you would have heard of him. Yes, we are playing Arnold movie trivia, and, and again, you're taking on two guests, Matt. Uh, you know what? This is a category I think I might win. All right. I, I, I tried feel, to switch I feel it up. strongly. I tried to switch it up a little Although bit. Although Jim, Jim, as we'll find out, is also a professional wrestler, so I'm sure he knows his Arnie. Absolutely. Also, Matt... Don't know if you saw this. I don't know who I'm kidding. I'm Hmm. sure you saw this. What? There is a new Spider-Man movie coming out. You don't say. Homecoming? Yes. Spider-Man Homecoming. What a ridiculous name. Is it? Well, I thought the name was ridiculous, and Mm -hmm. now the trailer came out, right? And there's always these hype about the Marvel. You got to see the Marvel trailer for the new Spider-Man or Iron Man or Ant-Man. Yeah, it's like people are interested in movies out there or something. No, it's terrible. And so I finally watched it. A lot of hype about it. And you have to agree, this this is a hot pile. No way. Yeah, I hated it. It was uh, another, awesome. No, another Spider-Man movie. He, he didn't do good with the amazing Spider-Man. He's on the downward slope. No, I, he's yes. on the upward swing. Are you kidding me? I am not kidding you. Cinema, Cinema War. War. Ooh, you are going down. I No, I'm going to swing out of here, man, Everybody's with a win. Sick. Everybody's sick of Spider-Man, especially this guy yes. right here, me. Matt, also, it's April. Right? It is is. April. And we have, as promised, the Jawheads, a new riddle Mm -hmm. every single month. And not only that, something hit me. I don't know what was Was it. Was it the brick that I threw through your window? Could have been. Uh, Something hit me, though. And I realized we we had done something about a year ago, uh, roughly, where we had tried to start up a movie club, a movie of the month club. And we did it uh, as... Matt always does a lot of his projects half-assed. <laughs> Don't blame this on me. Don't blame it on me, but man. I, we used to call Matt half-assed Matt. I mean, everything's just half-assed. <laughs> That's and not true. Just, That's I'm, not true. But we sort of abandoned the movie. Well, some things stick and some things don't, but, you know, sometimes you try again. Right. Like Spider-Man. And since we have been so good on giving the Jawheads a riddle every single month, mm-hmm. and they've been writing in a lot, and it's it's been wonderful back and forth with them, just hearing the feedback, we decided to bring back the movie of the month club, and this time really tie it into an 
actor and or director that has something going on in that particular month. Maybe look at a, a, a director's earlier work or actor well, or actress. Exactly what the Jawheads needed is an excuse to watch more movies. Yes. So here we are with that excuse for you. Yeah. So what we did is me and Matt, we looked over what's coming out in April, mm-hmm. uh, what just finished up in March. So let's announce the April movie of the month club first before we get to the riddle. Okay. Sound good? Yeah. Our, our thought process was this. Me and you had reviewed Beauty and the Beast, mm-hmm. which stars Emma Watson. There is a movie coming out at the end of April called The Circle that stars Tom Hanks and Emma Watson. Yeah. Can so it got it. us thinking, what else has Emma Watson done that we may have missed and that is readily available for us to rent and the Jawheads to rent so that way we can talk about it. We can get their feedback and have a movie, a proper proper movie of the month. Yeah, and in fact, I think this one's also on Netflix, so perfect. rent, if you have a Netflix subscription, no additional charge. Right. So our pick for the April movie of the month club is, Matt? Colonia. Colonial. Colonia. Colonia. I yes. want to make sure I'm watching the right movie. Yes, Colonia. <laughs> this also has a Daniel Burl, who is in The Zookeeper's Wife, mm-hmm. that we just saw. So Emma Watson. Was he in any, any other movies? Yeah? The Avengers, maybe? No. Was he? Yep. Oh, Captain America no Civil War. Oh, there you go. I have no idea. Um, or no, no, no. Am I mixing him up with Daniel, the guy who played the Nazi? Is that who you're talking about? Yeah, that's who I'm oh, talking okay. about. Oh, okay. Good, good. Okay. Good. All right. Um, we'll throw that in the job box, though. Just make sure Matt's right, because I don't know my Avengers, so I'm not going to... No, yeah. he was Helmet Zemo, but go ahead and look it up. I'll okay. look it up. Please do. Our movie of the month club pick, one more time, Matt. Is Colonia. Two weeks from now, by April 12th, write us, feedback at cinemajot.com. If you've watched the movie and you have some feedback, we will read some of that on that podcast right in the middle of the month. Yeah, and we'll remind you, so don't worry. Sounds good. Now to the riddle, Matt, as this has been a popular, popular... Yeah, the riddles are blowing up, man. It's really fun to, to read to read all the answers and to hear from the jawheads. I just wanted to say that. It has been. So we have to pick a winner of the March riddle. We so do. let's go over that again, Matt. Okay, what mar- was the March riddle? It was, I have started a movie all by myself. I like to drink Woodford whiskey. I have played a male nurse and a superhero. I have married Sandra Bullock, and I have starred in a flop with Jeff Bridges. Who am I? All right, we heard, and I had mentioned I was trying to make these harder as the months go on. We heard from more Jawheads, I think, than ever, Matt. Tons came in correct. One of those correct responses actually came to us from Australia. James Hilliard of Australia wrote in, Hey guys, I know you think you were trying to make it harder as the months progressed, but I got this one straight away. The star in a movie all by myself clue led me straight to Ryan Reynolds in Buried. He drinks Woodford whiskey in Mississippi Grind. Male nurse in Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Was a superhero in Deadpool and Green Lantern. Married Sandra Bullock in The Proposal. And then was in the flop R.I.P.D. with Jeff Bridges. That is correct. The answer was Ryan Reynolds. He went on to say, actually, Matt, a, a little note here, that he loved your pick of how are you saying it? Hiro dreams of sushi. Is that how you were pronouncing it? <laughs> I think I did say that, and it's 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 all it's all uh, Hiro's fault from True Bromance. I, I thought you said Euro. Or I something probably like said that, Euro. Yeah. Something. <laughs> Here's the thing: if you live in Chicago, you've eaten a Euro sandwich, and if you call it a gyro, people will. Uh, chastise you and kick you out of their establishment. So. Um, but yeah, he did say that he loves just even the looks on the faces of the sons in that documentary says it all. Thanks again for the great work, guys, that you put in. Regards, James from Australia. Uh, he was correct. Also, uh, one that came in correct, and she writes in all the time. She has nailed every single riddle. Nicole Thurman from Houston, Texas. She also answered correctly Ryan Reynolds and then pointed out, I'm guessing when the last clue was he was married to Sandra Bullock. She says, I'm guessing this is a reference to the proposal, but technically they never actually get married in the movie. And she is right. <laughs> so, Ooh, it's a curveball, yes, Ryan. You need well to do done. your fact checking. Hey, I try hard. And also a special shout out because she has been participating in every single riddle since the very beginning. Mm-hmm. And last year I had said that we would give a shout out to someone who answered all the riddles correct in 2016. Nicole Thurman of Houston, Texas did. Also, Chris White, there were two that answered every single riddle correct. Congratulations, Nicole. This year, since we started in January, we'll do something special if somebody gets all 12 correct. I am very excited for this. All right. So before we get to the April riddle, Matt, Mm -hmm. we need to pull a winner out for March. All right, here we go. The winner is 
Michelle Tate from Salt Lake City, Utah. Nice. Michelle, uh, we will mail out a prize pack to you. Mail us your address and we will get that out. Again, feedback at cinemajaw.com. Congratulations, Michelle. All right, Matt. It is April, as I promised. And uh-huh. this time I got serious with it. I got a little bit harder. But what do you think? A little bit more difficult here? I don't think so. Ah, I, anytime I know it right off the top is, is a clear sign that it's not that <laughs> difficult. All right. Well, I did try to up the ante here and make it a little bit more difficult than the first three. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the April riddle. I have starred in a famous zombie movie, but not its sequel. I have starred in one film directed by Wes Craven, and it was not the zombie film mentioned. I have been a villain in the Batman movies, and I have starred in two films with red in the title, one of which had Robert De Niro in it. Who am I? If you know the answer to April's riddle, write us feedback at cinemajaw.com. Your name will go into a hat, and you could win a prize. Do it. Yes. It might be cool to release the riddle on video, re- reading it completely clean, because yeah. you, you started, so yeah. All right, ready? Uh, right, I mean, it might be like a cool extra clip, so. Yeah, and this week's, uh, ready, Matt? Mm-hmm. Okay, here we go. Um, all right, Matt, so April's riddle is? I have starred in a famous zombie movie, but not its sequel. I have starred in one film directed by Wes Craven, and it was not the zombie film mentioned. I have been a villain in the Batman movies, and I have starred in two films with red in the title, one of which had Robert De Niro in it. Who am I? If you know the answer to the April riddle, write us feedback at cinemajaw.com. Your name will go into a hat, and you may win a prize. And include where you're writing us from. We like to know where the jawheads are listening. Yeah, always, especially like when it's Australia or somewhere interesting in Salt Lake City. Let us know where you're from. Um, The last riddle answer correctly actually came in this morning uh mm-hmm. for march um and he was like hope this gets in and he was writing from great britain so they're, they're coming in from everywhere that so. is so cool yeah it is really really cool we'd really love to is. hear where you guys are calling it no uh, doubt writing in from yeah all right matt so uh we got to get on with this jaw right we do let's yeah. do it so without further ado we bring in our guests yes we have jim perella actor in completely normal and robert Vornkall, who is the director writer welcome guys. Hey guys welcome to cinema job hey guys how are you and right at the top, what we like to do when we have uh, multiple people on the phone is just say who you are and and what you did on the project so people listening know whose voice is whose. Hey, uh, this is Rob. I'm the director and writer on Completely Normal. And this is Jim. Uh, I played Dylan in the movie uh, Completely Normal. <laughs> welcome, guys. Yeah, welcome. Uh, me and Matt had the chance to watch Completely Normal. And uh, congratulations on the film. It's, it's quite wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. We appreciate that. I, I love uh, when people actually get to watch the film, so that's a, that's a big bonus for me. So, And before we get too deep into the film, I just want to set the stage for the Jawheads, because it should be noted right at the top that I grew up with Jim Perella. Oh, okay. Yes. and Poor so, Jim. <laughs> yeah, poor Jim. Uh, <laughs> and you know how it goes. Like I have, I've been blessed with a lot of creative friends, and, and I've known Jim to be a, a musician. He wrestles. He's just an all-around creative guy, but when somebody sends you a project, you're always like, you know, there's a part of you that's like, oh no, you know, a project for my friend. And then I watched it and this is, this was truly a treat. So I, I really, I wanted to come off the top and say, wow, this movie uh, was awesome to watch guys. I, oh, th- yeah, go ahead, Jim. Oh, uh, no, I mean, I was really lucky to, uh, to be part of this. I was the actual only non-actor on the movie. And uh, it was really good to work with some people that um, are way more talented than I am. And uh, just to get out there and get some acting chops in and, and really kind of learn what it's like to be out there. It was, it was a lot of fun. Now, now the, the premise for the movie is that, uh, and obviously we're doing our, our top three awkward love stories or quirky love stories, is this idea that uh, this sort, sort of stalker, socially awkward um, lead actor is has a breakup at the beginning of the movie and then starts to fall for a girl with multiple personalities. And you can see where this is going to be quite quirky of a love story. Uh, where did this idea stem from Robert? Uh, well, I mean, it originally started as a short basically, which was that opening scene where I was, I was thinking about, you know, what would happen if, you know, you proposed to a girl and somebody said no. Um, and, and it kind of stemmed from there, uh, as a short. And then after that, 
we, we and my other co-writers, we thought, you know, what would be the worst case scenario for someone, you know, dating someone in New York? And we kind of ended up on this kind of really quirky, weird idea of like, well, what if this is like, you know, some girl that is like completely out of her mind and a little strange and has multiple personalities. And like every time you kind of like encounter, it's like a new person. And so we thought that part of it was pretty unique. And then once we got that part of it figured out, then we're like, well, what's really wrong with this guy? Just because like, you know, movies about normal people aren't very interesting. So we figured, you know, we need to give him some quirks and some some ideas uh, to, to flesh his character out. So we figured, you know, what's the worst kind of guy to be in New York that you would, you know, end up dating? And a stalker is pretty, pretty high up there uh, as opposed to like a Wall Street guy. But uh but, so we figured, you know, like, you know, putting the two worst people together and also, you know, trying to, to make it work in a movie as well. It, it kind of kind of all stemmed from that. Sure. And and, and that f- see now that you mentioned that that was a short film uh, makes total sense to me because uh, that was my favorite scene of the film. Um, it, it draws you in right away. Um, I loved it. So. Oh, yeah. great. Thank you so much. And, and- yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, you call him a stalker, this this character, Greg. Uh, I think that is one of the, if not the central performance to the entire film. His This guy, uh, Seth Kirshner, is the actor's name, correct? Yeah, correct. He knocked it out of the park. So the thing that you guys managed to balance so well is, yes, he's a stalker. And, yes, he's trying to figure out this, this girl that he's following. But he's also completely lovable which you know it balances the creepy and the lovable so well i think if that was that must have been a difficult tightrope to walk it it was a difficult tightrope definitely uh, i mean but thank god i had seth kirshner with me he's he's a good friend of mine and we had worked on a, a web series before uh called uh, we need girlfriends and he was he was one of the main stars of that so we had known each other prior to this and i had wrote this you know specifically with him in mind because i know he'd be able to balance that 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 creepy cute kind of uh kind of uh line <laughs> line to, to walk um and, and i mean there are other takes where he goes like off the deep end uh with with the creepy which you know we didn't quite make it into the movie but then like there's other parts where he was like too cute and like no it's not quite quite the bit so it, that was the great thing about working with him because he was able to give me such a range of you know from like zero to 60 of you know from cute to creepy that I was able to like work with in the, in the edit at the end. Now, now something that's uh, a little bit different than say the movie split that came out a little bit earlier this year with uh, James McAvoy, where it is just James playing these multiple personalities. Uh, Mm -hmm. You chose to actually use different actors to showcase uh, the changing personalities. Uh, Was that always the plan? It was, uh, at, at a certain point, like we, I had been watching like a lot of United States of Terra and like other kind of m- multiple personality shows where like, you know, you have an amazingly crazy talented actor who can like fly back and forth between these different roles. And I thought, well, kind of everybody does that with the multiple personality thing. So I thought it would be a little bit more unique to go and get different, many talented actors to be able to really display the different personalities of this girl. Um, and so like, and not, you know, negating Jenny Grace's performance at all, because she is an amazing actress. And like, there's tons of stuff that I had to leave out of the movie because she's, she's an amazing actress as well. But, uh, just, just being able to have that expandability of jumping into Geneva Carr's performance or jumping into Jim's performance to really like throw the the viewer off of like, who's going to come out next really, I think, added to the multiple personality aspect of the film uh, to not really, you know, depend on, like, the actor's ability totally to to flip back and forth. So that was something you, you knew before you even uh, started writing that you definitely wanted to use multiple actors. It, it wasn't, it was during the casting process where actually my cinematographer, who's a very good friend of mine, Brian Harnick, we were meeting and talking about the movie and it was actually one of his ideas as we were brainstorming back and forth, you know, one of those six or seven beer brunches where you're, you're talking about things back and forth super rapidly. And it was, it was a great idea that came out of that meeting that, you know, what if you just cast, you know, different actors in these different parts. And I definitely attribute that to him. And, and so how does that come to casting Jim? Did you guys know each other? I actually wanted to ask Jim a question, too, but go ahead and answer. Oh, that. yeah, go for it. Well, I mean, uh, it's, it's, sort well, of, it's sort of related. Go ahead, Robert. Sure. I mean, Jim and I knew each other. Uh, I had shot some music videos for Jim's band, uh, Two-Fisted Law. 
which I had met them through working with some other bands in the in the Westchester and uh, uh, Connecticut area, uh, a lot of different little punk rock videos and things like that. And we had been we had been working together. And I think Jim, we did like what four or five music videos together. We did a we did a you 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 videotaped a whole live show. Oh, that's right. Us. And then you did the uh, the May the Best Drunk Drive video and yep. um, Folsom Prison. J- Jim, you can't say videotape. Right. You got to say filmed. I mean, this guy's a film a film director. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you know, it, it was it was really funny because you know we we start video. You know, our the guy producing the videos or was like, you guys got to be up and at the first site by nine a.m. And we played the night, we had played a show the night before and we get there and we're all like doing the, oh, we were drunk the night before and we're squinting and like looking out, we meet Robert, we see all these cameras and we're like, holy crap, this is the real deal. Like we're actually going to shoot some stuff. And uh, Robert made it really easy. Plus we were annihilated, hammered, drunk by the time, (laughs) by like 11 o'clock in the morning. And uh, that's, uh, we call that method acting. Yes, Absolutely. (laughs) So, yeah, so he's putting the ca- the the cameras on this Mitsubishi Eclipse that was clearly too small for the five of us, and uh, we're driving around in circles in Danbury and thinking to ourselves, um, people are like, what the hell is going on? Like, what are these morons doing? And Rob's like, all right, we got to go around again. He's and we're like, again. He's like, yeah, again. We must have gone around the same circle like 400 times, and <laughs> by the time we get back. He's like, all right, you got two hours uh, before we shoot the next one. We all looked at him. We're like, what? And <laughs> <laughs> it was so, one of those. It was one of those classy jobs where we did, you know, two music videos in one day, which you know was was uh, subject to our our producer at the time. So, <laughs> but yeah. but we did get some good stuff and like, and it wasn't quite four hundred times. Maybe maybe no, like no. six or seven. But you know. no, yeah, it was it was a it was it was fun. It was it was pretty amazing and just having all those people like, why, why are these guys keep driving around in circles? <laughs> and then we're we're thinking to ourselves. Man, if we get pulled over right now, we're going to be in very bad trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Now, bringing it back to the film completely normal, uh, there are a, quite a few scenes that are shot on the New York subway. Did you guys get licensed to shoot there, or did you guys uh, just sort of go down at a certain hour and, and get things done? So, uh, about that, the the fun fact of New York City is you can shoot anywhere in the city without a tripod or without, you know, a large setup of cameras. And since our movie takes place in Queens, the MTA doesn't necessarily care as much about the train lines that run out to Queens or uh, along certain hours, like in the middle of the day when it's not rush hour or in the middle of the night when, when there's nobody on the train. So we were lucky in the fact that we did not get caught or kicked off at any point. So we didn't quite have permission for that stuff, but we also kept it very bare minimal uh, with like just the camera and a lens and like the sound mixer with the re- recording device in his backpack and just like lobs on the actors. And that was it. So it was like super, super basic to keep all that stuff like as, as minimal as possible. And then also to be as polite and courteous as possible to all New Yorkers around us so that we would make sure that nobody would be too upset with us. If we were like, Oh, hold on. Could, could you just get out of the shop for just a you know, hot second? So, so we can get this so it matches and I can cut it later. So yeah. well, it, it um, totally worked. Yeah, I was going to say the the other element that I wanted to bring up, Robert, was the score of the film. A lot of times when you watch these smaller independent films, they don't have too original of a score, but not the case with Completely Normal. Uh, how'd you go about scoring the film? I mean, I, I lucked out with, with having a great circle of friends around me from Hofstra University where uh, I met a ton of super great, talented people that you know still remain my friends these days, even though I asked them to work for free a lot. Um, and, and my good friends, Andy McCarthy and Dave Bede, uh, have, you know, produced all of the scores for all my movies, including the new one that's coming out. And, uh, they, they did an amazing job of creating like these really amazing little, uh, vignettes of like love themes and different themes for different characters and things like that. Um, but we did fill it out with like a few other tracks from, um, this guy, Kevin McLeod, who's based out of Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, which which I, I found through the internet. And he's, he's a very good resource of finding, you know, great uh, inexpensive tracks to, to fill your films with. That's a good resource. So so now that the film, you, you were finished with your guerrilla style shooting in the subway and you got mm-hmm. the whole thing edited, 
it made the circuit of the uh, the film festival circuit, and and it did quite well. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that and where the film is now. I know it's on uh, Vimeo on demand. What are the next things we can look for? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we had a great run of uh, film festivals where we actually just finished up. I think uh, the last one we were in was in. Uh, the UK screen one film festival we were just accepted into, but like we played all over, we played in Sydney, uh, Australia, we played in uh, Northern England and all, all sorts of different places, then also all the way across uh, the U S as well. So we had a really great run with the film, um, which I think, you know, having like a unique little weird love story kind of like fits well with a lot of billing. So it, it worked out well for us. Um, and then as far as like where it plays now, uh, we have it on Vimeo, uh, on demand, which you can purchase, uh, for a reasonable sum. And then you can also go on to Amazon video direct, uh, where you can purchase it there as well, or you can rent it as well. Do it guys. I, I, I highly encourage all the jawheads listening to check this one out. It's an, it's a little indie gem. It is. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and while we're talking about your new film, uh, you actually have a Kickstarter for it. Yep, that's that's correct. Right now, we're just finishing up post production on uh, my new film, which is called Nowhere, Michigan, which uh, was a crazy little film we shot over a year ago in my hometown of Iron Mountain, Michigan, ah, uh, which, north of which, Detroit. A little like twelve hours north of Detroit. Oh, is it up in the UP, Iron Mountain? It is, sir. It's ninety miles north okay. of Green Bay, okay. Wisconsin. So, um, <laughs> wow. I know you. I know you guys are f- familiar with that because you're Chicago based, but. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, we shot it up in, in the UP and, uh, it was quite a unique experience and we're doing a Kickstarter right now just to get, uh, do a little gap financing of finishing up the film just for like deliverables and DCPs and all the fun film festival, uh, stuff that we need to, to complete to get the film out there and, and done. And That's awesome. Yeah. For any of the listeners that want to, uh, maybe contribute to the Kickstarter program, uh, where are the best place to do so? Uh, if you search on under Kickstarter for Nowhere in Michigan in post-production or under the thrillers category of the uh, film and video section of Kickstarter, you'll be able to find it in there. Nowhere in Michigan. Under that. And also, as far as completely normal goes, if the Jawheads want to find out more information about that film, the best place to do so online is? Is to go to completelynormalmovie.com where you can find the links for our Vimeo and our Amazon uh, sites where the film is available to be uh, rented or purchased. Perfect. And and Jim, I, it should be noted that you also do some wrestling. Uh, Matt tells me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I've been. This is my fifth year of uh, pro wrestling. <laughs> nice. Um, just trying to uh, survive at this point. You know, the body's not recovering the same way that it used to. So at this point, it's, you know, just trying to get through it. Sure. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Well, do you, do you guys have separate Twitter handles also in case the listeners want to uh, follow along? Uh, yeah. Twitter handle, I think, is JimTFL on Twitter. Uh, mine's Rob Vorncall at Twitter, uh, but I'm a little bit more active on my Instagram, which is uh, Robert Vorncall uh, on Instagram. I'm also Jim TFL on uh, on Instagram. If you guys want to follow and check out what's going on in my neck of the woods, Robert's got the exciting life. <laughs> well, definitely follow him along. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do it. Now, we like to end all of our guest interviews with some silly cinema cues, we call them. Get to know the guests through the eye of the lens. Elias, you got something in the canon? Yes, I do. Um, so... Here we go. This goes for both of you. If you had to be stalked by one of these movie stalkers, who would you pick? Annie Wilkes from Misery or Max Candy from Cape Fear? Robert? Ooh. Robert's got to go first uh, on this one. Uh, oh, goodness. Uh, I would go with with, with Cape Fear. Uh, well, would I? Oh, God. Uh, yeah, no, Cape Fear. <laughs> I would go with Cape Fear because I definitely don't want my ankles broken where I'm sitting in a bed uh, in the middle of nowhere in... I think it was Colorado. It was Misery in Colorado. But uh, yeah, no. How about Jim? I, I'm going to have to agree. I, I don't want my ankles broken. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm old and fragile. I don't want my ankles broken. I'm good. Thank you. You know what's so funny? It's for, it's is for the best. How terrifying that scene is. I think anybody who has seen Misery is terrified by the broken ankles, right? Yeah, she hobbles oh. him. <laughs> but what's perfect is we'd rather have our entire family terrorized <laughs> on a boat <laughs> in the middle of a thunderstorm so uh, uh it's it's kind of a toss-up but <laughs> good right. stuff 
And so you did some guerrilla style filmmaking. So if you had to reboot a film uh, and remake it as a guerrilla style film, would you redo El Mariachi in a town in Mexico? Or would you redo Escape from Tomorrow in the belly of the beast of Disney World? Oh, Escape from Tomorrow is a great film. I would never reboot that. El Mariachi could use a little bit of love. So I, I would I would uh, guerrilla style El, El Mariachi. Good one. Solid answer. Yeah, definitely. All right. So Jim and Robert are sitting in on this entire jaw. They have their top three favorite quirky love stories. Yes, they do. Going to be a fun one, Matt. Indeed. Brings us to a segment called Eye for an Eye, Interested or Ignore. Elias? Eye for an Eye, Interested or Ignore, Aftermath. Two strangers' lives become inextricably bound together after a devastating plane crash. Inspired by actual events, Aftermath tells a story of guilt and revenge after an air traffic controller's error causes the death of a construction foreman's wife and daughter. The film stars Arnold Schwarzenegger and Scoot McNary and is directed by Elliot Lester, who is best known for directing 2011's Blitz. We throw it over to Rye. I appreciate Arnold every once in a while taking a risk for Arnold. This isn't some big action movie. It's a drama. But I'm going to be serious. I, I He does not have acting chops to pull off these. I know you may have liked him in Maggie, uh, which was a smaller uh, zombie movie. But overall, in general, when, when Arnold goes to act, it does not work well. I'm ignoring this one. I know why you cry, <laughs> but it is something that I could never do. That's acting. What do you got, Matt? I love Arnold Schwarzenegger. I actually think one he's he's one of the most accomplished and amazing people. He's just a, a really inspirational dude. The plot of this movie sounds like garbage. I'm not going to lie. But they should have just... You know what? They should make a movie just about those, those two main actors and just call it Arnie and Scoot, because I'm signing up for that movie. Listen, I could never ignore an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Interested. We throw it over to Jim. Jim, interested or ignore on Aftermath? Uh, well, I mean... As far as Arnold Schwarzenegger goes, uh, if he's not Ben Richards or the Terminator, I'm really not interested. You know, if he's not blowing something up, I really don't want to watch. So I'm going to have to go with Ignore. Robert, where do you stand? Well, considering this is the first I've heard of this movie, and but just hearing the name Aronofsky uh, being associated with it, I'm a little bit interested. Uh, because if Darren thinks it's good enough to get up on the screen, I'm kind of, I'm kind of there. Like, wow, two interesteds, two ignores. We throw it to Elias. What do you think, here, buddy? Break the tie. So I always like to vote for an underdog, and right now there's this huge feud going uh, between Arnie and Trump. So I'm gonna go for Arnie on this. I'm gonna say yes. interested. Oh, boost his ratings. You know, like, <laughs> wow. Wow, <laughs> I, I, that, that philosophy—that's a—that's a great one. There, sure. uh, we got three interesteds, one ignore for aftermath. We might have to check this one out. I, I'm very interested, actually. I, even if it sucks, I'm, it's it's going to be a fun train wreck, one way or another. <laughs> so this is one to watch. Yeah, speaking of new movies, me and Mac caught up with the zookeeper's wife. The more horrific side of World War II has been explored, rightly so, by countless films over the decades. The latest such entry is The Zookeeper's Wife from Focus Features. Will this entry compare with the other historical accounts? Ryan and I hit the theaters to find out. The country's completely overrun. They're forcing Jews out of their homes. They're taking us all to the ghetto. Thousands of people are dying. The littlest of children. We have room. We could hide them. Bring as many as you can. Ryan, The Zookeeper's Wife is a World War II drama directed by Nikki Caro, who last gave us the Kevin Costner vehicle McFarland USA. And it's based on the nonfiction book of the same name. It takes place at the beautiful Warsaw Zoo during the Nazi occupation of Poland and sees the eponymous wife, her husband, and small child get involved with the resistance and smuggle hundreds of Jews out of the infamous Warsaw Ghetto. Jessica Chastain plays the zookeeper's wife, and she is captivating in the role. I wish I could say the same about the other actors. Daniel Bruhl, who we last saw in Captain American Civil War as Helmut Zemo, takes another turn as the Nazi in what is sure to be not remembered all that much. 
He plays uh, Herr Heck, Hitler's zoologist. Before I go on, I have to state, I did not like this film all that much. The story of the heroic and historic deeds of the zookeepers is inspirational. However, while beautiful to watch, the film just never achieves any real tension, even in the moments that should have been gut-wrenching. The Holocaust is a very important and horrific part of history that I treat with total respect. However, this film just doesn't find the gravitas and ends up feeling like Schindler's List sequel to me. Something just didn't connect fully, and I can't seem to put my finger on exactly why. Maybe you can, Ryan. It has moments, though, like when the zookeeper is hiding Jews under garbage he collects to feed the pigs from the farm, the pig farm that his zoo has become under the Nazis' rule, and when he rescues a young girl who has just been assaulted by German soldiers. However, the life and death risk that these real people took to be such heroes is poorly conveyed in this telling. I'm in awe of the heroic actions who ran the, the Warsaw Zoo and rescued so many. I'm just not in awe of this film adaptation of those events. Would be great to watch for a history class, but better ones are available. Ryan, what did you think? You, you hit it right on the head here, Matt. I, I think the film failed to connect with me on, on just about all levels, uh, especially emotionally. And I would say I love me a good drama, right? I'm, I'm a guy who... who likes to get emotional at the movies. That's why I go there. Uh, I can even uh, well up with tears when I'm watching Beauty and the Beast, for, for Christ's sake here. But but the emotional needle did not get off zero with the zookeeper's wife. Yeah. I, I have seen plenty of World War II films and heroics of saving Jewish families before. Uh, you mentioned Schindler's List, a masterpiece. One in particular I thought to highlight here, which is way better and, and very similar to, oh, I know what you're gonna mention. is the 2011 Polish film, In Darkness, in which it tells the story uh, where people in Poland uh, hid Jewish families in the sewer system. Uh, seek that one out, Jawheads. I don't know if that's streaming, but it, it's a wonderful film, In Darkness. I would disagree. I thought Je Jessica Chastain serviceable, but Daniel Burrow, I thought, was actually the best part of the film as really? the Nazi zoologist. Ugh. And I never thought I would say Nazi zoologist um, on Cinema Jaw here, but I, I liked him in, in the role. Mm. Even the parts that were supposed to be intense, like you mentioned, and I didn't even care for hiding the people underneath the, the scraps that they were we've, seen, up. we've seen all this, right? It all didn't work. There was also a scene where uh, children are hiding downstairs and they're making noise at the exact wrong time when the Nazi soldiers are you know, above them. We've seen this numerous times and done so much better. Here it was just, I, I didn't even know why the kids were making noise. You've got to set up the scene so that at some point there's some tension, right? All of a sudden he's over and there's this, it, there's sort of an awkward uh, I don't want to call it a love triangle because it's not quite a, a full triangle here, but Daniel Burrell uh, character is is infatuated with Jessica Chastain's character. So he's always coming on to her. Right, and she has to keep up appearances. and Right, Yes, because that's sort of keeping everybody safe at the, at the zoo is to sort of keep this sort of thing going on and sort of leading them on but not really being attracted to them. Is that the best way to say it? Yes. Right. And so there's this scene where she is uh, with him alone. And these kids, I don't know, I, I literally didn't even understand it. Were they fighting or having a coughing fit? It wasn't even set up good enough to bring that tension of everything that was at stake. Think about it. I, I, I watched it. I didn't even care. Every single one of their lives. All of their lives. Everybody in that entire house lives were on the line. And the way it was conveyed in the movie was was. I'm just going to come out and say it, piss poor. I just, nothing worked there for me at all. Again, yeah, it's difficult to tear apart uh, a film w with such heavy subject right, matter. Right, and this is based on a true story. So it is, I, I agree. I mean, you're watching it at one point, and before the screening, there was a, a elegant lady that spoke, maybe a little bit too long, but she spoke, and it was, you know, about... Today's struggles with the with refugee refugees crisis. refugees and such. And I thought the film being called the zookeeper's wife was going to have something to do with the zoo animals to some degree because well, what I thought it did no not enough I mean I didn't think so I thought what happened to these zoo animals during wartime you know I, I thought that was well, gonna be we kind of find out a little bit but not enough I thought there could have been a little bit more done there totally agree with you it, it missed its mark wow so right you just mentioned a scene you had trouble with how about you Matt Kay yeah I mean it's tough to point to only one I think the film just didn't kind of find its feet in general, but I didn't like the ending. In fact, I found the ending very annoying. And you don't want to give exactly right. who I can't. survives away, but you know, there's one of these kind of deals where you don't know if someone's alive or whatnot and hated the ending of the film as well. <laughs> and, but I, the scene I mentioned 
wasn't my oh there's the scene that I, I disliked even more. You, yeah. So early in the film, before World War II starts, they are at the zoo having like a dinner party, and it's this sort of high end cocktail hour, and everybody's like in some type of evening wear. Yeah, evening wear, and out of nowhere, one of the elephants is giving birth. What a, what a coincidence, right? <laughs> so um, what happens? Jessica Chastain, the zookeeper's wife, has got to go out there, right? And Because the, the baby elephant's not breathing. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the whole thing is set up so terribly. And so she ends up running down to go save the baby elephant. It's not breathing. And what happens? All the guests from the dinner party, they come running over to the elephant's enclosure and watch her from like afar. They're all watching. Is she going to save this baby elephant? This scene, it, and this is early on, completely didn't work for me. There, I, you wanted to be anybody, if it's it's a beautiful animal like that or a child, and, and you see somebody come to life and somebody's maybe saving a life there, it could be very dramatic. Nothing at all for me. Did that scene work for you? I thought it fell flat, and I knew at that moment no. this movie's not going to work. I knew right then, I'm like, no, nope, this movie's going to be bad. Yeah, I, and I don't, listen, I have not read the book, and I'd like to. I don't know if that account is part of the true story or if it was an embellishment but it, to me it kind of reminded me of the scene in Jurassic Park where they where they saved the uh, the dinosaur it had that same feeling no it didn't work for me emotionally unfortunately how about positives fellows Matt you got a Any posi- good scenes a positive scene yeah I do one? have a I think that listen the movie is shot absolutely beautifully like the the framing the colors everything it's it's one of the more beautiful stories set in this sort of subject matter uh, so I would say the opening. She's riding a bicycle through the um, through the the zoo before before the the uh, the Nazis invade Poland, and it, it shows the the zoo in all its glory. And I thought it was a great scene. Yeah, it's amazing. That's what I have as my favorite scene as well. And and in particular, it's sort of I, I call it the calm before the storm. Sure. Right when World War II was sort really going, yeah, was gathering the steam, and she comes riding in the in into the zoo, and they're showing all the different animals who are are living along peaceful in the zoo, and you hear this humming, and the humming is almost beautiful, but it's as it's getting louder, you realize that it's the humming of of bombers coming uh, over Poland. But that little, as it starts low, and you see the animals in their natural habitat in the zoo, I thought that that part was awesome. Mm. And and there are some beautiful sets in this movie. Some of the de- destructed towns, when some of the battles take place, were well done. I'd, I'd tip my hat there. That's about it. Mm. Any movie influences? I mentioned In Darkness, and uh, We Bought a Zoo with Matt Damon. <laughs> oh, boy. I, Schindler's List is, you know... I don't know if this film would necessarily exist without that one. Got it. Did you learn anything from this movie? We did mention that it was strange to see what happened at a zoo when the zoo was bombed. Um, wild animals did get out. I would imagine that is probably That's true. What happens. So, so literally, you had these like large cats, cheetahs, and uh, odd, strange things roaming the streets of Warsaw. Well, there was fighting going on so it was almost like gladiator style all of a sudden there's there's machine gun battle going on and a cheetah's running across the street yeah, or a tiger yeah or wow. a camel running it because who knew what you know yeah. got out of the zoo all this stuff happened it was wild wow what, uh, what did i learn I, I would say that important subject matter does not automatically make a film important so that's good man that's yeah. good yeah one word reviews skip skip it wow can't recommend this one to the jawheads dud okay <laughs> <laughs> Let's assign some grids here, Matt. I'm going one jaw for the zookeeper's wife. I'll go 1.5. Mm. I, I did like some of the imagery, and I think that it, it hey. is it is historically accurate and valid for that. And you love Jessica Chastain in this film. I did, yes. I really did love Jessica Chastain in this film, and I thought her performance gave it that extra 0.5. It, it, she's a good actress. I like her a lot. All right, it, Jawheads, if you have seen The Zookeeper and you disagree or agree with our picks... Shoot us a tweet at CinemaJaw or write us an email, feedback at CinemaJaw.com. We'd love to get feedback. All right, so the zookeeper's wife did not have any awkward love story, quirky love story at all, Matt. No. But that is our topic this week because we have the actor and writer-director on from Completely Normal. Mm -hmm. We are doing our top three quirky love stories, and we thought we'd throw it over to Jim to get us started this week. Did you guys have uh, trouble with the lists? No, only because, like... As much as I like to play the tough guy in the ring, I am a big softy. <laughs> so some of these uh, some of these movies I do get out there and watch. I mean, it wasn't that hard. I have I have my three favorites. All right. Well, you're getting us started. What do you got sitting at number three? Mm-hmm. Number three, you got to go with uh, True Romance. I like it. 
How how is it quirky? Well, you got to think like that. There was a train wreck from the beginning. She's a hooker. He's a loser. Uh, that couldn't score a girl like that, even if he wanted to. It's kind of like the story of my life. And, uh, you know, like it just goes out and, and you know, you're watching drugs and, and gangsters. I mean, it's, you know, it's uh, they managed to Forrest Gump their way through a, uh, you know, through an entire drug bust and like Michael Rappaport's crap in his pants in the corner. Like it's a it's a great movie. It, it's no sure. like, here. Hands down. And and then through it all, they like managed to stick it out. You know what I mean? Like, it, you know, yeah, it's not, amazing. Not it's, to mention hallucinations of Elvis. I mean, any movie that has hallucinations of Elvis in it, it's perfect. Val Kilmer, man, playing Elvis. That's right. Perfect. Good number three to kick off the list. Absolutely. I like where this is going. We throw it over to Robert. Robert, what do you got sitting at number three? Uh, at number three, uh, it was a pretty big inspiration for Completely Normal, and it was Lars and the Real Girl, uh, starring Ryan Gosling. Wonderful pick. Uh, also on my list, uh, I love this movie. Yeah, it, it's fantastic. I mean, whenever like you know an awkward young man from uh, the Midwest orders a sex doll, and the entire town knows about it, it's pretty. It's a pretty entertaining film. So. And, and it's a deep film too, you know. I mean, it it definitely talks about. Uh, it's it, obviously it seems like an odd thing that Ryan Gosling's going to be in love with a, a a sex doll, but it it actually works on this idea that he had like a sort of a weird upbringing and uh, he's trying to cope with that, you know. Absolutely. So, yeah. Nice pick, uh, Matt. What do you got sitting there? All right. Listen, I seriously, seriously toyed with putting an Adam Sandler film. At number three. Hey, there was one almost on my list. It, really? When you're talking awkward love stories, absolutely. There, there, there's one on my list. There really is. But I don't know. Maybe it's it's uh, being inspired by the, the film that, that Robert made with Jim here. And I'm going with Silver Linings Playbook at number three. Two people struggling with mental illness. Can you? I mean, I guess you could point to Hunger Games as Jennifer Lawrence's breakout, but this is the one where we've really found out that she could act. You know, no, Winter's Bone. Early on, Winter's True. Bone. Okay, you gotta she, see this. this. She, the, nominated for Academy Award right off the bat. Okay, fine, fine. But I think this is the one that that reached a wider audience, maybe than Winter's Bone. True. And then Bradley Cooper, obviously, as well. But uh, and at the see, end, when we do our honorables, I'll say which Adam Sandler film it beat. Okay. What see, when you, you said Adam Sandler, though, uh, I, I thought you were going to go with Punch Drunk for a second there. No, because punch drunk was actually our temp score for the entire movie. Like we we sat we sat through and that was our temp score for the whole movie. So I, when you're going to Adam Sandler, I was like, oh, say punch drunk, say punch drunk. And, nope. <laughs> All right, I All will right. I will reveal which Adam Sandler film at the at the end. All right, swings All right. it swings it over to my number three and uh, controversy right off the bat here, Matt. Uh oh, for for an awkward love story, quirky love story, whatever you want to call it, because the characters end up not getting together at the end. Mm-hmm. I guess that's not a prerequisite. It's it's at least the journey, right? Yeah. My number three uh, came out in two thousand and two. Hugh Grant, Tony Collette. And a young Nicholas Holt in About a Boy. Have you guys seen this one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I remember it vaguely. I, I, I was, I think, I was sweeping up popcorn at the time at the movie theater. <laughs> but I do, I do remember About a Boy. Yeah. I, it was the, the weird poster. Like it, it was like a white background, just just Hugh Grant's face, right? Right. I mean, so Hugh Grant plays this guy who who really does nothing for a living. He is living off the royalties of his dad's songwriting ability, who wrote this like ridiculous Christmas song, and he ends up befriending. Marcus, who is played by Nicholas Holt, who's this young kid, and he's just awkward as he just doesn't fit in with any group. And it's partly because Tony Collette, in one of her best roles, uh, actually, she's great in everything, um, but she plays his mom and she doesn't let him go to McDonald's, doesn't let him sort of participate in he's, everything. He's over sheltered, yeah. no doubt. Mm-hmm. And so, because of that, he is socially awkward and he ends up liking this one girl who it ends up that Will in the movie, uh, Hugh Grant, likes the girl's mom. So the two are sort of friends and he's trying to get with the daughter. Uh, But ultimately it just becomes a friendship, but it works in the middle because Hugh Grant is trying to sort of like, you know, make the guy suave. So he ends up helping him out, buying him some new, uh, you know, sneakers and all kinds of cool stuff. And the ending in this movie is wonderful. But uh, if you haven't seen about a boy, I think they even made a TV show about it. Throw it in the jaw box. If about a boy was a TV show. made a TV show about about a boy? I believe so, yeah. But I love the film, so if you haven't seen it, check it out. That was my number three. Awesome. Yeah. We're into our twos. What do you got sitting there, Jim? I'm I'm sure I'm going to catch a little crap for this. Edward Scissorhands. 
Oh, no, that's perfect. Yeah, man. there's no crap to catch on that pick. Edward Scissorhands is just the epic roundabout Beauty and the Beast kind of story. And it's very well made. I liked the like the, all the colors that were used, how Johnny Depp played that character to a T. Winona Ryder, when she was still semi-normal and still a decent actress, like still doing her thing, was uh, amazing. And no matter how many times you watch it, it still tugs at you just a little bit. One of the last few things that Vincent Price did. I mean, it was just a great movie all the way around. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just... I agree, man. No uh, I, I don't know. Great pick. I'm glad Edward it was mentioned. I didn't think about it. Yeah, nice pick. Edward Scissorhands at number two. Uh, we throw it over to Robert. What do you got sitting there? At number two, I've got The Lobster, uh, starring Colin Farrell and Richard Weiss. Wow. Nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> D- definitely awkward. I love this movie to death. Like, just from the opening scene where you have no idea why this woman is just driving and then gets out of the car and does what she does. It's the like the most perfect, perfect uh, amount of awkward and crazy and, and weird. And then just leading up all the way to the end, I'm not going to say any spoiler or anything because it is pretty recent and not a lot of people have seen it or maybe they have because it's on Amazon Prime. But The Lobster starring Colin Farrell is amazing. Yeah, it, it was the only movie I was looking over when we sent out our newsletter. It was the only movie that appeared on both our top 10 lists, Matt. Huh. of the year was huh. The Lobster. So yeah, we both loved it here on Cinema Jaw. And and the ending of that film, when, when, the, when the credits are playing, and this isn't a spoiler in any way, uh, the credits are playing and the sound of the ocean is going over the credits. I, I think that was somewhat of the way the director was thinking, but maybe not. I don't know. I, you know what? That, that one deserves another spin. I agree. Great pick at number two, Matthew. All right. At number two, I, I have this thing. I like old movies and even though this one's pretty recent 2009 it plays out like an old movie it's complicated i mean listen you got meryl streep steve martin alec baldwin what else do you need is it quirky though oh absolutely it's quirky you don't think so no i mean i think it's a little odd because they're divorced they're getting back together but they're not quirky characters sure they are and it's one of steve martin's best roles he's he's really you don't, don't think it's quirky? No, I don't think it's quirky. The situation is quirky and yeah, awkward. Yeah, I guess I'd give that right? to you. Right? It's, it's, it's an ex-wife and an ex-husband who are reconnecting because they're having an affair. They both moved on and have other relationships. There, there's this other movie that's coming out like right now. It's in like limited release. That, that's pretty much the same plot. I throw it in the jaw box. I forget the name of it, but it's funny that they're almost like stepping over the same ground that, that it's complicated does. One of Steve Martin's most subtle and understated performances. The guy's a genius, and if you need proof, watch It's Complicated. And the great Meryl Streep. Come on. Come on, dude. And Alec Baldwin. Are you really giving me shit about this? No, I I would just say that the characters aren't quirky. When I'm thinking quirky love story, I don't think It's Complicated. I think It's Complicated. That's all. Oh, so we should have done complicated love stories. Exactly. Then that would fit perfectly. Decent. Thanks. Decent, okay. number two. Okay. Uh, now, when you're talking quirky, you, you go over to my number two. Oh, okay. Okay, this is awkward. This is quirky. And what a year it was in 2002 when About a Boy came out and also my number two pick came out. It stars the ever-odd James Spader and Maggie Gyllenhaal in Secretary. Wow, that's a good good call. Yeah, no, that's great. There you go, Matt. See, the, the guests are complimenting me <laughs> once again, right? Hall plays Lee, the secretary for James Spader's character, and they start to have a, a, a dominant, uh, submissive relationship. Yeah. And... A, I mean, this talk about one not to watch with your parents. It's 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 really strange. So Elias, <laughs> take your next girlfriend's uh, parents to this, right? Like on uh, Christmas. That, yes. that, that movie was the beta for Fifty Shades of Grey. So I mean, agreed. Uh, yeah, no doubt about it. It, I, it has one of the best movie posters of all time, where Maggie Gyllenhaal is just you know, bent over and it just says secretary. It's just like, what is this movie going to be? Yeah, about? it was pretty graphic. Yeah, it was, and and there's some just. I guess the best way to say it is almost uncomfortable scenes between like two major characters and actors like James Spader and Maggie Gyllenhaal, uh, where he is spanking her and, and so forth. But eventually what happens is there is this love relationship going on and it's actually James Spader's character that doesn't 
think he actually can go through with it. He's almost ashamed of himself to be in this relationship. Uh, but of course, you know, he pulls through. I gotta, I gotta rewatch this one, man. I, I remember enjoying it quite a bit. <laughs> I'm sure you did. No, Matt. not for the puerile reasons. Oh. I actually appreciated it as a, as a film. Oh, gotcha. A film now. All <laughs> yes, of a sudden, as yes, a film. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was my number two secretary. I do highly recommend checking it out. One of Maggie Gyllenhaal's best, and 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 Spader. Whenever he gets to play a creep, it's it, you gotta watch it. It's, he's great. I, he is great. Yes. Uh, we are into our number ones. Uh, what do you got sitting there, Jim? All right, uh, Brad Pitt, Julia Roberts, James Gandolfini, the Mexican. Um, very uh, barely a bell here. You're barely getting a bell, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. You you were worried about Edward Scissorhands, but you put the Mexican at number one. <laughs> in, in fact, you wouldn't have got a bell, but you're a professional wrestler, so I'm giving you a bell. <laughs> Listen, I this movie for me was, uh, you know, from uh, you got the guy who can't quite figure it out, the neurotic girlfriend, you know, the homosexual, you know, serial killer mobster guy who is explaining to them the wrongs and rights of their relationship and it's all based around an old kind of wonderful love story about how these two people got around to getting this 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 gun you know what i mean that was supposed to signify royalty and it really ended up signifying loyalty it was a great movie and wow can't believe, oh no can't believe Jim, that just was said I, that that barely got at a blockbuster with me. I don't know. Uh, I, I got to be honest. It, I, I I hated the Mexican. I, it's very very unmemorable. I don't I don't even remember liking any element of this film. I hated it. Uh, uh, Jim, I gotta. I yeah. Sorry, man. I, I want to come to your rescue here. <laughs> it's all good, dude. It's this is all where good. we pile on. This is where we pile. On. I will say at least at least it got the MythBusters treatment when they shot all the bullets up in the air. And and they come down raining down that and the MythBusters did uh, treat that scene so uh, yeah I mean I listen I, I I personally thoroughly enjoyed the movie f- uh, from the outside sense of it I I really liked it and uh, I'm entitled to my opinion and of I'll course you are power bomb every yes. one of you guys yes Jim. yes yes. <laughs> Actually, I want to throw it out there to the Jawheads. If anybody is on Jim's side on this, please write us and let us know. We yeah. want to hear from you. I, I, I think it is a, a first on Cinema Jaw that the Mexican was mentioned as a number one on, 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 on any top list. So, um, well done, Jim. Uh, that moves us over to Robert, uh, your favorite awkward love story. Well, I'm going to preface this with a personal story because it, it works out well uh, for my number one pick, where... I had just asked uh, my girlfriend out at the time uh, to go on a date, and this girl ended up being my wife, and we had just both dumped our two uh, other significant others 24-ish hours before that, and we went to go see my number one pick, which is Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Ah, good call. A proper proper number one, Jim. (laughs) (laughs) Where... Where that inspired some conversation after the date, and like it's it's an amazingly technical achievement of a movie, and it's just like a perfect like awkward love story where like you have this like socially weird science that's available to you, and you and you decide to like if you're going to delete this person out of your memory and things like that. It was just like super topical and like personal at the time so so that's why it's number one my number one i do have a very close number 1.5 but we'll get to that when we get the honorable mentions but. Cool. sounds good. agreed uh i would have had eternal sunshine number one on my list as well but i, I do talk about it quite a bit on, on yes Jaws. So i switched yeah. it up a little bit uh matt what do you got at number one all right guys listen when you're talking about quirky love stories the first one that should pop into your mind taking it all the way back to 1993 we Is got, it on VHS? It, absolutely. Of course it was on VHS. <laughs> Johnny Depp, Mary Stuart Masterson, Benny, and June. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. oh yes. Real nice yeah. one. I think a lot of people have forgotten about this movie, and it's a shame because it was it was way offbeat. It was before Johnny Depp. I, I'm pretty sure it predates Edward Scissorhands. And, uh, I don't know. Throw that in the jaw box. It's, those are right around that time. Okay. Johnny Depp's star was, was pretty high, and he... he at this point, it's it's kind of a risk for him playing this this mentally ill character. No, I think that was right in that time when when he was playing like when he started the character work. Yeah, right. When he was playing Edward Scissorhands, and he, I remember for years thinking he was just an oddball because of Benny and June and Edward Scissorhands and so forth. Benny and June no. is such a heartwarming, touching love story, and I love it. It is really the prototype for a lot of stuff that would come later. 
No, absolutely. That's definitely a perfect pick. That was that was in my uh, uh, my Netflix queue at the time when I was writing uh, Completely Normal. So absolutely. Nice pick. Yeah, you're all you're all a bunch of bastards. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's no the Mexican, but it's something. <laughs> awesome. Swings it over to my number one, and it was stolen. It was stolen by Robert with his number three pick. I did have Lars and the Real Girl as my number one. Oh, we'll sub it out. Ryan Gosling in love with a, a, a sex doll. What what could be more awkward than that? <laughs> I, I will sub it out. And if you're ever going to sub your number one out, mm-hmm. you got to go with a Zach Braff masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so you have one of two choices. <laughs> I am speaking of the movie where he teamed up with Natalie Portman in Garden State. Great movie. Yeah, that yeah, is a no, great absolutely. movie. Yeah, and, and obviously here the awkwardness uh, really comes in, I guess from both characters, but mainly from Natalie Portman, um, who is, is definitely a, a strange bird. She makes these odd noises and says, you know, this makes me feel better because no one's ever done this before. It's definitely just a strange character. Um, and obviously Zach Braff is, is dealing with uh, the death of his mom and coming back into town. It has a sort of a hipster soundtrack, right? Um, oh, absolutely. And a lot of like cool well, slow I, I, motion moments, but I, I still I think up. it would predate hipster at that point. This is before the hipster movement, I would think. I, I was actually going to say, I think it might have been part of the, 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 the precursor to the whole hipster thing. It was like the, I, the prototype. I'm, I'm going to agree with that also because I like this soundtrack and I'm not a hipster at all. Uh, but yeah, no. <laughs> It definitely pops up in, in my iTunes once in a while when it, when uh, one of those uh, songs comes up from Garden State. You know, a clear sign that you're a hipster is always <laughs> saying, I'm not a hipster. I'm, hey, man. <laughs> Jim, Jim, am I a hipster? Not by far and away. No, you're not. Yeah, thank you. Thank or, you. or or also uh, saying you're, you own the Mexican on, on LaserDisc. <laughs> <laughs> now, now that's a hipster. Yeah, there that is. Go. It's true. <laughs> All right. Uh, funny and ironic. <laughs> <laughs> now we did promise the jaw had some honorable mentions uh guys what do you got uh i i don't know see i would i there was an adam sandler movie that was sticking out in my mind which one we'll uh, see if we got the same one i was gonna go with 50 first dates that's exactly what i had too man <laughs> you guys stink no that's another it's terrible i mean it's so <laughs> I, okay no it's, it's not passable. terrible you it's you passable. suck you no, don't know how to have fun it's it's passable it's movie. not passable it's a two-jaw movie. dude it, that's the, all it is here's why jim back me up no, on this no you know what it is is adam sandler sucks and so when he makes a decent movie matt matt wets his pants that's not true that's i'm true. not even it's not true <laughs> I'm not even that big of an Adam Sandler fan, okay? But this movie is good because the premise is so unique. And it's so heartwarming when he when she starts to remember him. It's one of the best... I, I honestly think it's one of the best love stories. It's certainly one of the best quirky love stories. If we were doing five, it would have been on the list. I, I figured that was what was on your list. I did have an Adam Sandler as an honorable mention, and it was Punch Trunk Love. That was on my honorable mention. And my, also, there you go. My, that is a respectable Adam Sandler. There you go. And my only other uh, honorable mention that was not uh, talked about on this list was Shop Girl with Claire Danes, Jason Schwartzman, and Steve Martin. Once again, we're... It's Schwartzman, who is sort of an oddball and falls in love with Claire Danes, but she's going for Steve Martin. All right, what about you, Robert? You got any honorables? My, it, it's, it's not an honorable. It's my 1.5. It's between two and number one, and it's Amelie from uh, 2001, the French, French movie that's an amazing cinematic masterpiece. Sure uh, is. I, I was also at a crossroads, too, mentioning Chasing Amy. I think Chasing Amy is another good uh, under... I, under mentioned movie as far as quirky love stories go. No, I agree. Yeah. There's, there's this cool a cool love triangle in that as well. Yeah, yeah I, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, and I think one of Kevin Smith's better, better attempts. So I think, I think it's definitely better. <laughs> now I'm sure we missed some of the jaw heads picks out there because there's a lot of quirky love stories out quirky there. Quirky love stories. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So like if- the Mexican, <laughs> 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 Got to bring up the Mexican again, but if we if we've missed your favorite quirky love story and you have Twitter pulled up, shoot us a tweet at Cinema Jaw. We will retweet it and get the discussion going. What we're gonna do is take a break, and when we come back, Matt is taking Jim and Robert on in Arnold Schwarzenegger movie trivia plus a Cinema War, looking at the new Spider Man. We'll be right back on Cinema Jaw. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's. 
Hey, Jawheads, it's that time of year again. C2E2, Chicago's Comic and Entertainment Expo, is back, and we're going to be there once again. Yes, always a good time. Matt has turned me on to the comic conventions. We go, we talk, we like to meet up with Jawheads. Uh, so if you're going, shoot us a tweet at Cinema Jaw or reach out to us. We'd like to meet up, have a beer, and walk around the convention floor. Yeah, April 21st through the 23rd. Check out more at C2E2.com, and we hope to see you there. It's one of the most fun jaw events of the year so come on it's like our super bowl yeah hey elias check out my new knn air filters hat oh that's awesome dude wow you look like super cool all of a sudden oh thanks man i got it at knnairfilters.com backslash podcast are you saying knn like two n's in a row well i'm so glad you asked actually it's knfilters.com backslash podcast you can get yourself a new air filter for your car which is going to make your car better and they'll throw in a free hat. Got it. So and that it. makes your head look better. And we are back on Cinema Jaw, hanging out with actor, writer, and director Jim and Robert from the film Completely Normal. And as we mentioned, that the film is actually available to rent. So people listening to this can go to Vimeo On Demand and or Amazon. And I want to ask, as Robert, as a filmmaker, how exciting of a time this is to be able to shoot a film like this and actually be able to put it out for, for distribution. Uh, that's pretty exciting, huh? Oh, it's a fantastic time to be at this level of filmmaking and be able to like do something that I love to do and then be able to get it out to the, the entire world. Like We've got people renting the movie in Germany and in the UK and, and Japan, and, and Amazon is such a great platform to be able to get stuff out there. And it's a very, very open door with them. Like you can, as long as like all your, your technical details are perfect, they're, they're more than willing to help support you get, get, getting your film out there. And then also Vimeo as well with their great, their, their sharing program with the profits and things like that. It's, it's a fantastic time to be a filmmaker. That's pretty neat. Does it work sort of where you get stats? Uh, as you mentioned, you see them uh, watching the film or renting it from all around the world through Amazon. Do you get stats on that? Absolutely. That's I mean, cool. they definitely they keep you up to date with where it's being purchased and like they're not like down to the city level, like where like with like Facebook or anything like that, where they can target down to the, to the millisecond. But but with Amazon and also with Vimeo, they're very up to date on who's renting it where and like where you can push your ads and things like that so that you can definitely make sure that people know that your film's available and, and, and ready to go. So awesome. So one more time for the listeners listening to this that want to check out Completely Normal, the best place to do so is is to go to completelynormalmovie.com and there we have links for our Vimeo page and our Amazon page where you can go and purchase whichever whichever platform works best for your personal home viewing entertainment. Do it, Jawheads. Exactly. Yes. Now, before we get to trivia, before we get to Cinema War, we threw a few items into the jaw box and talk about a guy who is not completely normal. Elias Rodriguez, let's open up that jaw box. What's your pleasure, Mr. Cotton? The box. We got a box! Oh, what's in the box? How's it going, fellas? Pretty pretty well. How are you? Great. I gotta say we have a full house jam-packed jaw in this room here. We have our new video intern, William. What? Is, is that what that guy is doing with the camera? <laughs> I didn't even know who this guy was. Yeah. Yes. Just wandered in, I thought, off yeah. the street. So when uh, Ride the Movie Guy berated Matt K on 51st Dates, uh, you might actually be able to see a video of it on our YouTube. <laughs> so look out for that. We're trying to build the video team here. Yeah. So let's dive right into these questions here. Uh, was Daniel Burrell in Captain America Civil War? Yes, he was. All right. Helmet Zemo. Yeah. Always worried about when Matt's throwing out facts like that. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know my Avengers, so. Right. Was there an About a Boy TV show? Yes, it was 12 years after the movie release in 2014. Wow. Was it called About a Man? No, <laughs> yeah. 12 years Could've later. Been. Could have been, yeah. Could have been, not bad. Uh, but I can't vouch for the TV show, but again, if you haven't seen About a Boy, wonderful movie. One, mm. one of Hugh Grant's best. And, uh, Matt Kay, you said there was a movie similar to the style of the It's Complicated film. Well, it's similar storyline, at yes. least, yes. H have and you seen this movie, or are no, you just taking I, a guess? I, honestly, it hasn't come out. I've only seen the trailer. Right, and that <laughs> is The Lovers. The premise so, is exactly the same. It's, it's a married it. couple who are both having separate affairs, but then somehow come back together, and they're having an affair with each other. Uh, so, very similar to uh, It's Complicated. Gotcha. Interesting. Um, and let's see. So uh, which came first, Edward Scissorhands or Benny and June? So Edward Scissorhands came out in December 1990. 
Benny and June, Ooh. April 1993. Ooh, so three years oh. Scissor Hands yeah. did predate. Were, were, it, while you're in the jaw box looking at it, was there any films in between Benny and June and Edward Scissor Hands? Oh, good question, Rye the Movie Guy. Yes, there was uh, <laughs> Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, which I remember as a kid, and Arizona Dream. Can't vouch for that. The Freddy's Dead thing was just a flashback. Is that right? what that was? I don't even know. Was that the one where yeah, the... Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, okay. yeah, because Johnny Depp dies in the first Nightmare on Elm Street, so that was a flashback scene. He was already by, far and, by far and away, my favorite Freddy death ever is Johnny Depp getting blown through the, blown into the ceiling from the bed. It's awesome. Yes, <laughs> it is very awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. Wes Craven was a genius. Was that everything he was? He was. God rest his soul. That's all? All right. Get back in that jaw box. All right. Matt, it brings us to a segment called Cinema War. Cinema War, it works like this. Me and Matt, we're fighting on a topic. Our guests, Jim and Robert, they're playing judge and jury and telling the listeners who won this Cinema War. And it's important. It's very important because we were fighting for 20 seconds. A jaw time to rant and rave on whatever we want. Are we going to put in the best of five here? Not quite yet. Come on, yeah, man. We're, we're what are we waiting close. for? We're getting okay. close. All right. All right. Oh, you want to start on, it on April? Best of five. I, I just listened about this. You got to do the best of five. Oh, you got to do it. You, you heard that on the podcast? Okay. I did. The I twenty did. second thing means nothing. So we're <laughs> starting the best of five now. Okay. We're starting the best of five now. Elias, you're keeping track of this. Put it All in right. your notes somewhere in the jaw box. Sure thing. Um, Etch it into the wall with your fingernails. <laughs> All, right. All right. Best of five. <laughs> you're <laughs> You're on, Matt. Uh, there is a new Spider-Man trailer coming I out. I stopped giving him sharp implements like pens and pencils in there. It's just yeah, the danger to himself and you, others. You caught on. Yes. You caught on early. Now, listen, there's a new Spider-Man trailer out for another Spider-Man movie. I don't know why. Elias, tell the jawheads at home what today's Cinema War topic is. Today's Cinema War topic, will the new Spider-Man film swing the web slinger back into good standings with audiences, or is the wall climber doomed to get caught in the same old web of the audience apathy. Matt, you'll be fighting for yes, he will be swinging into good graces. Rye, you'll be fighting for no, we are tired of Spider-Man. Let this friendly neighborhood cinema begin. Rye, Tony Stark's presence in the trailer is not a coincidence. It's as if Marvel Studios is telling us, okay, people, we have adult supervision on this one. You can relax. They are not going to use up a film in the RDJ contract without a damn good reason for it. Oh, Matt, I watched the trailer, uh-huh. and I had no excitement. None. Zero. I was confused if I was watching a Spider-Man movie or a Birdman prequel. Michael Keaton as Vulture, who I've never even heard of, did nothing for me. We have seen Spider-Man's best villains. Leave it alone already. That's funny, because I have two words for you, Rye. Michael fucking Keaton. That's three, you idiot. Birdman. (laughs) Birdman. Batman. Beetlejuice. Mr. Mom himself is starring as the villain, and from the trailer, I think he looks pretty damn awesome. No. This will be six Spider-Man movies, Matt. Six Spider-Man movies in 15 years, plus he showed up in that dumb Civil War film, so that's six and a half movies in 15 years. Three different actors have portrayed him, and he keeps getting younger somehow. This trans Translates to moviegoers saying, I don't care anymore. Look, let's get serious. Star Wars is out of the clutches of Lucasfilm. The Matrix is out of the clutches of the Wachowskis. And now Spider Man is out of the clutches of Sony. If there has been a proven absolute in the universe, Rye, it's that the MCU is the best superverse on the silver screen, and fans are stoked to have Spidey in it. Stoked. The Spider-Man cast keeps getting younger and younger. Pretty soon, Aunt May is going to be a hot babe. He's always been a high schooler. Yeah. All right, listen. I complain about Hollywood not giving us fresh ideas in general. How about just a fresh comic book film already? I've seen Spider-Man, know his story, and seen five of his adventures, which include, Matt, 10 of his villains. Enough is enough already. Just pick a new superhero and I will be happy or somewhat happy. Spider-Man's awesome. Listen, this is the studio who in the last decade made Iron Man more popular than Superman, gave us the left field hit Guardians of the Galaxy and delivered a Doctor Strange movie that nobody was asking for, but even the most hardened critics were forced to admit was pretty damn good. These guys know what they are doing And Spider-Man is a golden goose. They cannot mess this up. They will not mess this up. 
Matt, it seems each superhero franchise has one magnificent chapter, such as The Dark Knight was to Batman. Spider-Man already had his in Spider-Man 2 when he faced off against Doc Ock, played beautifully by Alfred Molina. This is not going to be better than that. Did you see the ridiculous scene where he is holding together a split airplane in midair together? Hilarious. I think it was a sinking boat, but okay. It's ridiculous. I don't care what it is. I'm not believing the hype. Spider-Man is caught in a web of doom. Die already. Wow. We are button heads here on Cinema War as we do each and every week. And this time it counts, Matt. It does. It's like we're, we're the Major League Baseball All-Star game. This time it counts. <laughs> <laughs> um, we throw it to our guests, our jury, Jim. Robert, what did you think of the Cinema War? Robert, you go first, man. All right, man. I wrote down every single point <laughs> that Brian did not make uh, for this. <laughs> and... And first off, he, well, lastly, he referenced Spider-Man 2, where, yes, Alfred Molina did play a brilliant Doc Ock, but James Franco is in that movie? I don't know, man. Too many movies for Spider-Man? Mm, I will watch a Spider-Man movie no matter what. And uh, good that he's, I think it's good that he's younger uh, because he's 16, he's a high schooler, he's supposed to be that age. And also, let's see, oh, yeah. Michael Keaton? You think that's a negative? <laughs> Are you kidding? Wow, I, I can't catch a break here. Uh, but I, I mean, he well, looked, ask Jim. I mean, who, see if he agrees with who him. the hell is Vulture. What do you think, Jim? Uh, well, first off, I'll watch just about anything with Michael Keaton in it. Oh, so Jesus. you thinking you thinking he's a negative is is just ridiculous. I mean, I agree. Yeah, you should probably go sit outside for a while and think about your life. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's just upset because I put him down with a Mexican. Oh, <laughs> uh, listen, that's that's the least of your worries. I am normally not a fan of Spider-Man. I will I will openly tell you I I think he's just he's definitely not up there with any of my favorite superheroes. But the small section he had in the Civil War movie, though it was corny, was still pretty cool. Uh, the fact that right off the bat you put Tony Stark in the opening, you know, a few scenes of the movie. And by the way, Aunt May is a hot bitty in that movie. I don't know what the hell's going on in that. <laughs> yeah, that is a but, little odd. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I'm hoping that maybe this time they'll get it right. Maybe with being able to rate it in the PG-13 or R area will mm. help move it along. I mean, I'm hopeful that maybe they'll be able to resurrect a positive, uh, I, positive view of a Spider-Man Jim, at this all point. Right. I, I don't Jim, even I got, know. I, yeah, go ahead. Jim, I got two words for you. Web wings <laughs> and web wings. Oh, yeah. I'm so, you have no idea how excited I am about web, web wings. It, what, what is this? Some, some type of Chinese term? I don't even know what you guys are talking about. He's got the wings. <laughs> this is like a glider. He's got the wings. Like, Web it wings? Was in the first, it was in the first teaser. Oh, where, like, he, 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 like, it, oh my it's God. like a 1960s thing. Oh it's, my God. Come on, man. That's the original Steve Ditko right. version of Spider-Man. All right. It sounds, like exactly. I, I, it sounds like I lost this one, but I'll throw it to you guys. Uh, you guys both side with Matt? Yeah. I, I, I also side with Matt, even though he didn't mention John Watts, who's an amazing, <laughs> amazing director. And if you haven't checked it out, watch Cop Car. It's on HBO right now. That's an amazing, amazing film that definitely got him this job. So... All right, Matt, that earns you 20 seconds of jaw time to rant and rave. Really quick. Uh, uh, yeah, really quick. Everybody should go watch the Spider-Man trailer because it was awesome. <laughs> Ridiculous. Oh, I'm so tired of it already. Yeah, I get really ready am. for a great summer, Rye. Yep. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I torture myself? I don't know. I don't know either. You know, I have to sit through freaking Oscar season where oh, we're all like, say, Ooh, oh, what's Meryl Streep doing this year? Who cares? I Bring on the superheroes. I, I, I don't know. I, I want to be happy. I want to like these, but I watched it and I was like, it's so terrible. And I know Matt's going to be so excited. Just and, learn how to have fun. I, 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 I Will you? your excitement level about it even bothers me more. It's, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, how already. dare I get yeah. excited about going to the movies? About Spider-Man for the 18th <laughs> time. Jesus, who cares? All right. Whew. Half of America, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. So we, angry. <laughs> so <is> angry. Bitter. <laughs> I'm upset. All right. Here we go. It's trivia time. As we mentioned, Arnold Schwarzenegger has a new film coming out, Aftermath. So we are playing Arnold movie trivia. It works like this. Eight questions. Robert, Jim, you're our guests. You guys get to choose if you want to go first or let Matt go first. There are steals. And if you get hung up with a question, you get one trip to the ER for our engineer, Elias Rodriguez. What do you guys want to do? Uh, I choose Ben Richards. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let him go first. We'll we'll go we'll go second. Oh, okay. How's that? Sound? Wow. Right. Sounds right. good. 
All right. They defer. Yes. Question number one over to Matt K. Matt, in 1988, Arnold was in Twins. What actor was his twin in the film? Oh, come that was on. that oh, was on. speaking of Michael Keaton. <laughs> that was the Penguin himself, Danny DeVito. They always start out easy. First two questions gets everybody comfortable here. All right, question number two, uh, over to the guests. Here we go. In 1994, Danny DeVito starred with Arnold in another comedy. This one involving a baby. Name it. Junior. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> one to one. All right. Now, now we'll, we'll slowly start to pick it up. Question three swings back over to Matt K. Matt, in 2013, Arnold teamed up with this actor in the film Escape Plan. Name it. That's a good one. That is, yeah. 2013 Escape Plan. Yeah, that was supposed to be his big comeback, and nobody saw it. Crap. Um, mm. I you, saw it. You did? I did okay. see it. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> I didn't see it. Um, you do have a lifeline if you want to use it early. Mm. No, I hey, think I'll save us. it, even though I know these guys know it. <laughs> I'm just going to guess. Was it Was it Ryan Reynolds? I'm going <laughs> to slap you, man. <laughs> Ryan <laughs> Reynolds? It's a comedian. I can't think wow. of who the hell it was. Uh, we, you guys got a chance for a steal. Uh, Robert, ahead, Jim, Robert, you guys know this one? Judge Dredd himself, Sylvester, Sylvester Stallone. Stallone. Wow, they take a commanding two to one lead and, and it swings all the momentum over to Jim and Robert because question four is over to them. Guys, Arnold starred in the indie film Maggie, which I mentioned earlier in the podcast, trying to protect his daughter from turning into a zombie. Who played his daughter in the film? Mm. Ah. <laughs> you, you do have a lifeline if you need it. Jim, do you see it? No, I didn't see it. It's a little early for a lifeline, though. <laughs> you want to pass? You want to pass it back? Yeah, let's pass. I mean, you guys could take a guess. I mean, you know. Nah. <laughs> no, just no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That is incorrect. It's just, just a no is incorrect, Matt. Uh, you've seen this movie. We I actually have. reviewed it on Cinema Job. Yes, we did. Oh, that's a fair advantage. Yeah, but I can, I can see him. <laughs> you guys can't see him, but he is he is literally just holding his head because he cannot think um, of the actress. I got it. I got it. I got it. it is, I, I knew it was the girl from uh, Little Miss Sunshine. It's Abigail Breslin. Oh, God. Wow. Matt K comes up and ties this thing up. Oof. Yes, two to two. Exciting stuff here. And question five now throws back over to Matt K. It's swinging like Spidey. Yep. Matt Arnold has starred in. <laughs> all right, stop it, guys. All right, Arnold. <laughs> Arnold has starred in three films directed by James Cameron: Terminator One, uh -huh. Terminator Two. What was the third? Oh come on! I'm guessing not <laughs> Terminator Three. Um, this is Matt K, guys. You might have a chance here. Uh, Terminator 1, Terminator 2, directed by James Cameron. Correct. There was one other film in there with Which, Arnold. What question number is this? This is question number five. All right, I want to keep this momentum going. I'll go to the ER. Whoa! I don't know. Question oh. number five, trip to the ER. Elias Rodriguez, what was that third James Cameron-directed film that Arnold was in? Your clue is, I am telling you the truth. This clue should help. Oh, man. True lies. <laughs> Ah, yes. Damn. Thank Elias. <laughs> Thank you, Elias. He keeps your momentum going here. It is three to two, Matt K. Question six. You can tie it up here, guys. Arnold starred in Jingle All the Way, in which the <laughs> oh, marvelous man. Sinbad starred as his enemy in the movie. However, what actress played his wife in the film? Oh, you man, bastard. that is a deep cut. That's a deep one. <laughs> Arnold, Sinbad. And what actress played his wife in Jingle All the Way? Are we going to the ER? We should yeah, go. Let's, we should go to the ER. <laughs> yeah, we'll go wow, back-to-back -back trips to the ER. Elias Rodriguez, who played Arnie's wife in Jingle All the Way? Your clue is name of Tom Hanks' volleyball and more. Is it his wife? Is it Rita Wilson? Wow. Yes. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> What a ball game we got here. Wow. Great game. Wait, wait, what was her name? Rita Wilson? Wilson. Rita Wilson, yeah. And his, and his volleyball was Wilson. What a clue by Elias. He comes good. up with I these think, in the job box. It's amazing. Uh, it is three to three. 
Last two questions of the game. You can cut the tension here. This is great. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Question seven over to you, Matt. Okay. In 2013, Arnold teamed up with Johnny Knoxville for this action comedy. Ugh. Name it. 20, 2013? 2013. Arnold and Johnny Knoxville in what? Can, can we get some freaking 80s questions? No way, Matt. <laughs> and you do not have another lifeline. Oh, man, I don't know. What did he do in 2013? With Johnny Knoxville, mind you. That doesn't Come help. on, man. <laughs> the last stand. Jack, Jackass 5. <laughs> that is incorrect. I believe the answer was just given by Jim. Uh, guys, what, <laughs> what is the answer to question number seven? The Go last ahead, stand. The last stand. <laughs> oh, my God, really? <laughs> yeah. That was hilarious. I, I didn't know. You, you I had, had no, no idea. You had no funny, clue. Funny enough, Johnny Knoxville actually saved that movie from being a bigger pile of crap than it already was. <laughs> it was almost as bad as the Mexican. Now, here oh. We oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> hey, they have taken the lead here. It is four to three, and it's the last question of the game. So you guys can win this on a walk-off or give Matt a chance to tie it up. Oh, God. Robert, Jim, yes. we all know that Arnold starred in Kindergarten Cop. But what classic comedy director directed that film? Uh, they also have burned their lifeline. Kindergarten it's Cop. It's not John Hughes. Is it Chris Columbus? Uh, I actually, I, I want to agree with you, man. You think it's Chris Columbus? I, I think so. I, I'm, I'm reaching, but I think it is. Uh, no, it's not. No, no, no. Chris Columbus, his first big deal was like Home Alone. This is... Uh... <sighs> no, 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 no. Ivan Raven. It's Ivan Raven. It's to- like, it's our favorite movie, Jim. Ghostbusters. It's Ivan Raven. Yeah. That is, that is correct. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well done, guys. Uh, virtual handshake here. Virtual handshake, fellas. But there's one more question, right? No, Maggie. that's it. Oh, that was eight. That was eight. They started. That was yeah, it. Yeah, that was it. Okay. Oh. So they win this one, Matt. Well done, guys. Yeah. That was a good game, though. That was Dang. a good game. They win this one five to three. Uh, it was pretty good. F- it, if it came down to a tie, we call it a jawbreaker. This question would have been specifically over to Jim. Jim, Terminator 1 or Terminator 2? Uh, well, Terminator 2. Incorrect. Would have got that one wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, I'm a Terminator 2 fan myself. The real jawbreaker was this. Age of James Cameron closest to. Matt? Uh, let's see. Jimmy is, I would say, hmm. I mean, not quite 60. So 56. Elias, lock him in at 56. Robert, you got a guess? Uh, 67. Why do they got to make it so hard on me? Um, I believe they're right in the middle here. He's 62. Ah. So who who won? What did you guess? 56? Yeah, 56. We, we'd give that one to Robert. Okay. Yeah. Well done there. Yeah. Sure. Very close, though. Jeez. It is close. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. Um, brings us to the end of a great jaw. You Indeed, know? yes. Yeah. And first and foremost, we got to thank our guests. Jim, Robert, uh, thanks for coming on Cinema John. Nice talking to you guys, and, and best of luck with uh, future projects. Thanks, oh, thank man. you so much. We appreciate the time with you guys. Thank you. Yep. We also got to thank the best engineer in the biz, Elias Rodriguez. Thanks, guys. Matt, as we mentioned, we are on YouTube, and we have a videographer, William, who has been <coughs> filming us, uh, which is, is quite crazy. So I don't know what, what this is going to do. This is Elias's little project. <laughs> yeah, we're going to see if we can get some fun clips out of this. If not, build the content that we've already been doing, like the Behind the Jaws little fun review sketches we've been doing. Uh, hopefully get those out on a very regular basis. I think yeah. the moral of the story here, fellas, is go to YouTube, search Cinema Jaw, and hit the subscribe button. Do it. And uh, a, a special thank you on those, because uh, especially before William had joined the team, Phil, our editor here, who does a m- amazing work each and every week editing the podcast, yes. actually was doubling up here and actually doing a lot of video editing as well. Yes. So uh, thank you, Phil. Yes. Um, also, Matt, we did promise that we should read the riddle one more time. Here is April's riddle. I have starred in a famous zombie movie, but not its sequel. I have starred in one film directed by Wes Craven, and it was not the zombie film mentioned. I have been a villain in the Batman movies, 
and I have starred in two films with red in the title, one of which had Robert De Niro in it. Who am I? Perfect. Until next week, I'm Ryan the Movie Guy. I'm Matt Kay. And keep on John about the movies. movies.